the time is now 12 o'clock and we have a jam-packed agenda for you all. And so we want to go ahead and get started. Uh, I am Dr. Michael Whittier. I have the pleasure of serving as the Director of the Office of Health Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion here at UCLA Health. And it is my privilege uh, to uh, share with you all our Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Fourth Annual Health Justice Symposium. And this is actually our first one in person. So we're really excited uh, for the panelists and the conversation that we have uh, today. Uh, and it's all focused on the great challenge, uh, reintroducing humanity into healthcare. And so with that, we are very, very excited. Uh, but before we do that, I wanna take a moment to uh, do a land acknowledgement. Uh, as a land grant institution, UCLA Health acknowledges our presence on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tungva peoples. We pay respect to the ancestors, elders, and relatives past, present, and emerging. And so, to transition us into why we're here, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King had a ter terrific quote, and we get a lot of quotes uh, around and near his birthday, uh, but uh, given this is our Health Justice Symposium, that's there's one that uh, stuck out to me, and that is, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it is the presence of justice. And so as we talk about advancing health equity, using that as a vehicle to get us to health and justice. We must recognize that we must confront conflict, we must confront tension, uh, and we must exist in an uncomfortable state to move us forward. Uh, and so without further ado, I would like to introduce my chief of health equity, diversity, and inclusion here at UCLA Health, uh, Dr. Madel briggs Melanson. Good morning, everyone. Actually, should I say good afternoon? And it's great to see everyone here today at our fourth annual MLK Junior Health Justice Symposium. So I want to extend warm welcome to everyone here in the room. And there's also a large amount of people that are coming and joining us virtually. So I want to say hello to you all as well. As Dr. Whittier mentioned, we are going to have a fantastic symposium today. And what we're going to do is really think about what we as healthcare institutions, what we as healthcare professionals can do in order to partner more with all of our community leaders and partner in a way that is meaningful and impactful so that we can truly transform the health of all communities. So today I am joined by two phenomenal people. Um, I must say that Ms. Felika Jones, who is the Executive Director of Healthy African American Families, is unable to make it with us today, but please, we actually uplift her in love as well as in prayers, and I know that she's going to join us in another event. But I do want to turn it on over and bring out my two colleagues who I have had the pleasure to know and get to know even more in terms of this symposium. And the very first person I want to bring out is Dr. Cynthia Gonzalez. So let's all give a round of applause to Dr. Gonzalez. And the next phenomenal person I would love to bring out is Derek Still. Come on out, Derek. All right. <laughs> I, well, we are excited to have both of you all here. So why don't we take a seat and jump right on in. And so one of the reasons why we wanted to definitely, it's okay on first name basis, yeah. <laughs> is that we wanted to actually engage in a conversation with both Cynthia as well as Derek, and really in order to really gain their insights and perspectives, especially about our theme of reintroducing humanity into healthcare. And so what I want to first start off with, and I'm grabbing all of my mini bios for you all, because you all are just fantastic. And I'm first going to tell you all a little bit about Dr. Cynthia Gonzalez. So Cynthia Gonzalez is the co-lead of the UCLA CTSI Community Engagement and Research Program, an assistant professor of Charles Drew University of Medicine and Science, and the director of the Community Partner Policy and Action Stream for the Party Rand Graduate School. 
Cynthia is a first-generation Mexican-American lifetime resident of Watts, and that brings a strong background in community-based participatory research, cultural anthropology, and social ethnography to the understanding of community wellness. Influenced by her upbringing in Watts and daughter of immigrants, Cynthia develops place-based initiatives through community engagement and neighborhood assessments to improve the quality of life for low-income and racial ethnic minority residents living in under-resourced communities. In addition, she has developed partnerships between community, government, and academia through efforts like the Watts Rising Collaborative, Watts Community Studio, and the Los Angeles Promise Zone Young Ethnographers Program. Through this work, she has partnered with the Housing Authority of the City of Los Angeles to write a multi-million dollar application that launched the Watts Rising Collaborative. So we are so incredibly honored to have you on the stage with us today. <laughs> she definitely deserves that. <laughs> oh, we're just getting started. <laughs> and now moving on, to Mr. Derek Still. So Derek Still is an experienced problem solver who started his career as an electrical engineer at Northrop Gummon. And currently he serves as the executive director of the Social Justice Learning Institute. He started his journey with SJLI, which is what we affectionately call it, focused on recreating local food access systems to solve health disparities and food insecurity in the Inglewood community and beyond. In addition, under his leadership as the Health Equity Program Director, he stewarded a team who taught over 10,000 families in nutrition, physical activity, and urban arch 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 agriculture. They also went on to build 126 gardens in the community and also began the Inglewood Certified Farmers Market, as well as the Inglewood Community Supported Agriculture Program, or the CSA, and the Food for Thought Produce Program. He and his team also significantly influenced the passing of three major state bills impacting food insecurity in the wonderful state of California. Under Derek's leadership, SJLI has continued to thrive and is recognized as a thought and a movement leader in health, education, racial, and social equity. He is proud to use his unique skills from over his 13-year career to lead SJLI as they solve the inequities that continue to plague communities of color, especially those within the Black community. So once again, let's give a round of applause for Derek. All right, so now you understand how we're in the presence of greatness in every single way. So what I would like to do is just allow the two of you all, I gave a little bit of a bio, but I definitely can't give you all enough justice with that. Um, and if each one of you all can just share a little bit about yourselves, the work that you do, your passions, and why showing up in this space was so important. So Cynthia, we'll start off with you first. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. It's it's an honor and a privilege to share this space uh, with such incredible folks. Um, bios are quite hard for me. Um, always the accomplishments, the accolades, and the journey is actually the hard one. Um, it wasn't linear. Um, it was really tough um, to gather an alphabet soup after my name. Uh, says a lot about a story as a first generation Chicana from Watts. Um, so I, I wanna honor my parents, my community, and the folks that have enabled me to sit here and talk to you all. And that's the reason why I'm here. Um, because um, uh, my lived experience has been the most, uh, the biggest lesson in my life. And school was just really a protective factor that helped me find the words to explain my lived experience. Um, uh, so yes, um, I have a couple of affiliations and titles and whatnot, um, but I come to you reflecting on all of that, um, how I got to where I'm at um, and how I learned uh, very quickly about my own position in the world. Um, I, uh, uh, as you shared, um, I was born and raised in Watts and I still live there. I was born in the old MLK hospital um, to the point where I went to King Drew High School and they have like a research program and you get to work at the hospital at that time. Um, and I worked in the diabetes clinic in the room where I was born. Um, it was incredible, like that experience, just something else. Um, I benefited from youth programs that led me to do some research at Drew while in high school. And that just propelled me into a direction that I never thought um, I would be in. 
Um, it's unfortunate that that's the case, that um, I was one of the lucky ones to benefit from a program that then exposed me to a life um, that stats would say um, I'm a positive deviant. I deviated from the status quo. Um, so yeah, uh, my parents are uh, immigrants from Mexico, uh, and I grew up in Watts when it was predominantly Black. And so my relationship to Black liberation movements, to the Black struggle is in solidarity um, because of what I've witnessed and um, with my friends, my neighbors, um, and the shifting community that I experienced. Growing up in Watts, yes, the stigma tends to be real. It was really hard in the 80s and 90s. Um, my house was at a, at a T, um, and uh, Grape Street hits my house. That was a gang boundary at the time. So the Bloods and the Crips would come and shoot at each other. There, so bullets went through my house, uh, cars got broken into, and my relationship to violence was normalized. Like, why would I live any differently than anyone else in the world? Why would an eight-year-old, my brother, walking home from school, would have a bullet sort of pass right by him and normalize that? And it wasn't until I left Watts that I realized that there was a difference, that not everyone grew up the ways in which I did. My parents tried really hard to move, but we had built a social structure. We had built a network. And my brothers and I said, nope, you can leave. We're staying. Like our friends are here. Our community's here. And I think that feeling remains today. Um, I'm happy to say that I'm rooted in the neighborhood. And so my passion for serving community stems from that experience. Um, I ended up continuing to do work at Charles Street University. Um, I had been there for over 20 years um, and exposure to research to community-based participatory research happened in that space um, while I finished school and collected the alphabet soup after my name. Um, and now I, I find myself sort of sharing, um, sharing sort of the, the issues of disparities, of differential treatment, of how is it that we need to bring folks to the table to make decisions about their lives um, in a very sort of intentional way. Um, and that happens through an understanding of the books. What it, what are, what's the data telling us, right? The data doesn't lie to us. And how are we interpreting that? Um, and what are the stories of these communities that are experiencing um, the injustices and what can be done? Not, and I'll, I'll stop here and just sharing. Knowledge production is really important, right? Research sharing. Like, we know this, we know X, Y, and Z. We know these differences. We know um, what best fit practices there are. But applying them is even harder. And in the experiences I've had, um, working with nonprofit organizations, working with the government, implementing the strategies that we suggest in research is the hardest of everything to do, but it's the most impactful. And so ensuring that we work together is the ways in which we can move the needle, if at least slightly, because the work is really, really hard. So it's a commitment to that is really essential. So yeah, happy to talk to you all even more about that. Well, Cynthia, thank you so much for really providing some insight into you and your passions and your origins and what you said it just now, 100% in terms of we, this has to be a partnership to move this needle because this work is hard and this work isn't going anywhere. And so we'll talk more about that. And so Derek, I'm going to pass the mic to you for you to you know, tell us a little bit about you, about your passions, your organization, and your, like what I like to say, plot to change the world. Right. So how, how is everyone doing today? All right, cool. So this conversation will go really well because all the energy that's in the space and also up here on the panel uh, is already in the right place, uh, as mentioned, Derek Steele. Uh, I, I like to start the conversation um, about who who I am, right? And, and I think in any space that we all get a chance to walk into, I think it's really uh, important to re remind yourself of that story that you're writing every single day. You know, I am a Black father. I'm a son. I am a husband. I am uh, a uh, a brother, a nephew. Uh, my my grandparents, I, I, all of them have passed away. So I have the responsibility of helping to carry the mantle forward for the next generation of my own family. Um, I went to Morgan State University, Baltimore, Maryland, HBCU, uh, as an electrical and computer engineering major, uh, which got me the opportunity to be able to come out to Los Angeles uh, and uh, get the chance to uh, be a part of a phenomenal um, organization. I mean, yes, I, I did engineering at Northrop for about three years, but that's a blip 
when you talk about the macro picture of where I feel like the reason why I came out here, uh, which is actually the work that we do here now at SJLI. Um, you know, I was diagnosed with uh, hypertension at 25, right? And so that set the tone and set the trajectory of my life uh, of really thinking about how to really transform my lifestyle, right? I mean, when we went, I went to go see the doctor and he told me, yeah, yeah, we just got to change your lifestyle. And I asked him, I was like, well, well, how do I go about doing that? And he didn't really have any answers as far as I was concerned. And so I went to what most of us would probably do. I went to Google it. And uh, how do I change my lifestyle? Um, and, and the things that kind of come up as you, as you, uh, as you would think is, you know, you know, fruits and vegetables, of course. And like, so you start to think about access, right? Living in the city of Inglewood, uh, right off a of century, um, you know, where there is access to, uh, 25 different, I'm sorry, access to a myriad of different fast food restaurants and, uh, liquor stores, convenience stores, the nearest grocery store is about two and a half miles away. We didn't have a car at the time. Right. And so in my mind, that transformation, I needed to get access to healthy food. We would walk to the grocery store. But when you walk your neighborhood, when you walk your community, not only do you get to see the people who are there, but you also get to see what the environment actually really looks like. And uh, the, the question of how we transform our built environment came to bear after weeks and months of taking that walk. Uh, we, we had to even. Uh, stop going to the local grocery store because that grocery store's produce wasn't high quality. So then starting to understand how even uh, our grocery stores, because of capitalism, you know, put the nicer quality produce, uh, produce uh, selections in the more affluent places, you know, for a lower cost, but then put the, the lesser quality in, in uh, lower income places and put a premium on that cost, right? So So you start to see these dynamics kind of play uh, out and you start to ask the question of what do we do about this right and you know I want to give uh, a lot of love and kudos to my my now wife because at that time she, she was the one who was asking that question and and coming up with the ideas of what we could do and getting the chance to uh, meet the, the leadership over at SJLI Dr. D'Artagnan Scorza at the time who was working with young people thinking about food and food justice in our community in Inglewood uh, and, you know, make a long story short, because I could I could give you all the details of like how that went. But uh, being able to volunteer at the time uh, at Inglewood's first community garden and being able to grow the food and create the access that was missing and transform the landscape just with the ideas first, but actually putting those ideas into action. Uh, so here we are 14 years later where the health equity team uh, in the last uh, uh, two years have done more than, has uh, uh, delivered more than 3.5 million pounds of produce in the hands of people for free, uh, who has, uh, you know, made sure that uh, community members have access of information, but also physical access to the things they need to be able to transform their lives. Uh, how our team uh, at SJLI, you know, who, you know, the organization itself is focused on improving the overall health education and well-being of youth and communities of color. And we do that by empowering community members to be the change they want to see, right? We are an institute, so we do conduct research, but I think what makes us unique is who's doing the research. It is our young people. It is our community members by way of participatory action research uh, who are identifying the, the, the problems, but also coming up uh, by way of using the research with solutions to be able to solve those issues, right? And the end of the day, we want people using their own agency in order to change each other's lives. And we using the Social Justice Learning Institute as a as a tool and as a even sometimes as a catalyst in order to invoke that change. Uh, so this work has been tremendous. Uh, there's so much that we have been able to accomplish, you know, with the work we're doing in the schools with young people um, and, and how the young people are moving uh, you know, and creating uh, policy and advocacy along the way. Uh, but there's so much more work to do and we can do it together and be able to accomplish the things we're looking for together. So I am grateful for starting off as a volunteer to now being able to be the second executive director of this fantastic organization, leading a phenomenal team, uh, not only here in L.A., but also in Houston, Texas, thinking about how we can grow this, uh, grow our work uh, nationwide 
uh, and be able to bring this type of mentality of how uh, the people power can actually invoke the change that is necessary, especially with equity at the center of what we're doing. Uh, so this is this is a great time to be in. Uh, we were we were talking before and I was saying, you know, uh, you can always mark a watershed moment. But I think this period of time that we're in this year in 2024 is one of those times that when they flip the pages to the history books, they'll be talking about what we have done. And the question becomes, do you want to be a nameless gray face or do you actually want to really stand up, speak loudly, do the things that are necessary so that they can always talk about the work that we have done together? So I start with who are you? Right. I, I spoke to who I am. But as you're sitting here and you're listening to the conversation, think about who you are, too, and how you're contributing to this larger movement uh, that we're all part of today. Thank you. Yes, please. Round of applause there. And Derek, just to highlight some of those pieces, and thank you for that charge to everyone who's here with us physically, but also joining us virtually. What is going to be your contribution in this incredibly critical moment. And that's what we're gonna talk about because you also talked about something that was very important about being the change that you want to see, but then also for those of us that are in healthcare organizations or other social service organizations, we also play a significant role. Not only do we need to be that change that we wanna see, but we need to also be there to partner and amplify the change that we know community is already doing themselves as well. So I want to start digging into a little bit of a roundtable set of questions for the two of you. You all know I have a lot of different questions that I think that we should talk about and, and want some of your wisdom. And so the name of this symposium is the Health Justice Symposium, and that is intentional. And, you know, we talk a lot about health equity, but there's actually a higher level of achieving justice. What does health justice mean to each of you? And what do we really need to do in order to get there? And so Cynthia, we'll start with you. Um, I, I will say, um, I, I don't think health justice and equity are mutually exclusive. Um, I think equity is rooted in injustice and uh, justice by essence is equity minded. Um, I'll, I'll talk, you, you mentioned the Watts Rising Collaborative. It's sort of a big part of my heart and passion. Um, uh, growing up in Watts, right? A lot of decisions were ma made for us, not by us. Um, and the resources and opportunities that came into the neighborhood were really already decided upon. Um, in trying to figure out what this PhD was gonna be for me, I wanted to learn more about my neighborhood by asking the people who lived in the neighborhood about their priorities. And so slowly, um, we, to make a long story short, we designed the Watts Community Studio. We are on the third version of it 10 years later. Um, and what it was, was um, I started with a 12 page questionnaire that would take two hours. And I was gonna interview 200 residents of Watts. It's eager doctoral student, right? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, we we have the lowest life expectancy, you know, enter disparities and inequities and data associated to that for Watts. We check all those boxes. But the most beautiful part about the neighborhood is what folks don't know. We're still community driven. We're still um, organizing together. All of the resources we've had in our neighborhood are because of the leaders and the organizers that predate me. And this is this has not been anything given or handed to us. This has been by demand, right? And so I became obsessed with like learning more about my neighborhood. And it was really funny. I didn't want to do it by myself. So I partnered with our local city government and we brought in like nonprofit cross-sector organizations to talk about this assessment that I wanted to build. And they laughed at me. They're like, really, Cynthia, 12 pages, two hours? That's not going to happen. And I got it handed to me, y'all. But all I wanted to do was make the case that residents of Watts aren't asking for wealth. Communities like Watts are not asking to sort of exceed some sort of baseline demographics. We're asking for dignity. We're asking for justified wellness where we don't have to go outside of our neighborhood to seek the basic human resources that are necessary for our well-being. And who knows how to do that better than the people that are experiencing that? And so the Watts Community Studio was born. We developed a survey that ended up being three pages long, self-administered for 15 minutes. And 
lesson learned y'all uh watts is a great space where i've learned so much and then i'm sitting here with my little survey thinking well how am i going to administer it what's going to happen partnerships right it was us working together for a common cause we ended up finding a summer youth employment program out of the city and we hired local youth from watts trained them on cbpr on social justice on demographics of watts on census data like we nerded out because i just love being a nerd and they were like loving it we did this mapping exercise with them we were just doing this like organically like there was no plan it was just like they're going to help us get surveys and they're going to get paid for it and we're just going to build capacity for them like why wouldn't you do that um and the mapping exercise was, can you, like, we taught them how to use Google Maps and, like, can you point to, like, assets in your neighborhood? And they're like, the only asset is a train station because we leave the neighborhood and then like, come back. Like, there's nothing to do here. Then after they did the surveys, there was so many, they're like, there's a park. And do you know there was a drum circle here? And there's all these churches. And, like, they would have the longest sur survey took two hours because folks were actually sharing. Like, residents wanted to talk about it. They've always wanted to contribute. We still haven't had an issue with getting folks to share their perspective and priorities because there's hope of change. Um, and the youth were changing. And little did we know that we were creating a youth program. We were training them in CBPR. We were exposing them to like planning and different disciplines. They were asking us like, how do you open up a bank account? How do you um, uh, get a California like license? I, I mean, a ID. And we started doing workshops. How do you write an abstract? How do you present posters? They learned how to enter data. Um, they learn how to like um, analyze SPSS output and create their own recommendations. This is a long answer to the health justice question. What I'm saying is that bringing folks to the table to make the decisions to shift their own health is really essential, where everyone arrives at the baseline level of quality health. And that's not where we're at right now. Um, I, I will say that first report of the Watts Community Studio then, fast forward eight years later, um, the uh, Strategic Growth Council, the state of, of California, launched a $33.25 million grant to improve environmental health outcomes, public health, have displacement avoidance and whatnot. And they wanted to be community driven, community led. We had data to share neighborhood priorities among all of the other archives of what we've done in Watts where the residents sort of vision their future. And we actually led to actionable steps. We were the first highly ranked awarded collaborative where folks let history alone, let politics at the door and said, we're here together because we've been left out of multi-million dollar opportunities and we're gonna come together to improve our health. So systems came together, healthcare, planning, um, housing, employment, and we de designed 18 projects that are now bringing resources into the neighborhood to improve um, public health and decrease uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'll share a little bit more about that, but I think health just justice within that context is enabling folks to participate in, in their own well-being and the decisions that are being made because we, we know there are disparities, right? There's a lot in the literature around that. So we, we, we can't say that we've arrived at a space where we're all sort of achieving health equally. It's more understanding how do we create that baseline and enable folks to make this decisions for their well-being. Absolutely. So again, going back to that importance of agency, making decisions for the, the people of community have to make those decisions and enabling us to ensure that. And, and, and I really just want to amplify what you mentioned about, it's about that respect and dignity. And that's something that here at UCLA Health, we continue to really push as well. Like when we have the privilege to take care of so many people, we need to ensure that everyone is treated with a level of respect and dignity. And we're looking at them as that whole person. So thank you for that. And so Derek, what are some of your thoughts about health justice and how do you define health justice? What else do we need to do to get to health justice? Well, I, I really appreciate the tie between justice and equity, right? Because I think, uh, you know, defining that becomes really critical. You know, so starting with equity, you know, it is the natural law or right. And I, I want to underscore natural law or right to justice or proportional fairness. Right. And and the underscore on natural law right is really important because this is not a nice to have. This is not a, you know, well, you know, this is this is cool to do for now, but we don't need to do it later. No, the natural law or right to justice and proportional fairness is what is necessary for the lives to be able to be full. Right. From a health equity standpoint, we want to make sure that people are living whole, free, thriving, healthy lives. 
right? But when you start to look at the world that we're in, that's not the case, right? When you, I think, I think health equity underscores the idea of like how we actually obtain justice because health equity, when you look at it through that lens of what is, what is that proportional fairness or what is that justice, it is, it is making sure that we're removing the barriers to, to people living those whole free lives. So that is making sure that people have fair wages and fair jobs. That's also making sure that people have access to healthcare. That's also making sure that uh, people have access to providing the information like was just shared. It's also making sure um, uh, uh, that people have quality housing and quality education, right? All of these things, if you think of it like concentric circles that exist and them all coming together, that point in the middle is the person living that whole free thriving life. But it also has to come with all these other aspects actually being taken care of at the same time. Right. So when you look at it from that point of view and you start to think about, OK, well, from from a health standpoint, uh, are, are we are we there? Have we created that proportional right? I mean, uh, uh, right to fairness? Uh, no, we haven't. Right. Access is not is not equitable. Um, people being able to voice what's going on with them is, is not equitable. When you start to think about the systems and how they were created, it was not created in a way of thinking about the uh, multitudes of us, particularly those who currently are in that deficit, being able to live that whole free thriving life. And that is what we have to get to. That's the work that we have to do in order to make that happen. And so when we start to think about the systems that exist, uh, that, that keep, keep that from, uh, from taking place, you start to think, well, yeah, there's there's a lot that we're going to have to like start from scratch on, right? Because uh, the foundation of this of these systems, the foundation of this country, unfortunately, is not built um, with the, with all of us in be in the idea of thriving in mind, right? So we have to rethink that that process and then start to start start from there and determine, okay, well, how do we build from that from that aspect? Uh, do we have to like destroy everything and start from scratch? Maybe not. You know, because there's many of us who uh, understand how we got here and understand how to uh, take pieces apart to re restructure them so that we can uh, be better together. Um, but we have to be able to have that voice. We got to be able to come around the table and 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 have that discussion about what's missing, so we can make sure we have the add-ons that are there as well. You know, so uh, in that idea, again, th there is a. Uh, tie between justice and equity and and you have to be able to achieve one in order to achieve the other absolutely I completely agree and you know really emphasizing those social drivers those those health related social factors that we know make up so much of what occurs with one's overall health and well-being and you know here at UCLA health just tying back into what the two of you all said they're not mutually exclusive and in fact we say that health equity, is the stepping stone along the path to justice, right? Absolutely. Say that again, Doc. Health equity is one of the stepping stones along the path to justice. You're writing that down. You're writing that down. That's well, cool. they should know it. That's that's one of our mantras <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, and, and the reason why is because, as you all said, equities, when there is that fair and access to being able to thrive in wellness, but it's within still those systems of oppression that we still have within this country that have existed for generations, while well, justice is where we have to dismantle or adapt or change and get rid of those systems that have been causing these inequities to begin with. So really, really important pieces there. And thank you all for sharing that. I just want to add real quick, I, I think it's really important. That's why it's so important to define these things, right? And to make sure that we're all using the same language and we're not having like leaning our own understanding of what these are. Like we have to make sure we're defining and starting from that same piece. So when we do come around the table and have this discussion, we're using the same language. We're thinking about the ideas in a similar way so that we can figure out how to dismantle and also rebuild. Absolutely. So a couple more thoughts and questions for you all. And there's just so many things that I know that I want to ask, but I also want to make sure that there's time for the audience to ask you all some questions too. But let's go to our theme. Our theme right now is the great challenge, reintroducing humanity into healthcare. And again, we're here at UCLA Health. We are, our core business is providing healthcare services as well as training the next generation of physicians and nurses and other healthcare professionals, and then also scholarly research. Have we ever had humanity in healthcare? 
And if we have had it, how did we lose it? And what do we need to do to get it back? I can, I can jump in. Please do. <laughs> so have we ever had it? Again, let me, let me take a step back to take a step forward, right? Uh, what are the dynamics that people, that human beings are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, we should start with the idea that the ecological and contextual factors that make up a life, right? You know, that environment, many people don't have a choice in that environment, right? So the young people that we work with in Inglewood didn't choose what family they were born into, didn't choose what uh, neighborhood they were born into or what services or, or opportunities that exist there. But that environment has everything to do with their life course outcomes. So when you start to look at the graduation rates, the health rates, the um, uh, the, the opportunities for full-time employment, uh, the homelessness rates, like all of that has everything to do with the built environment. But that also has everything to do with that person's um, dimensions of human development. So their health outcomes, their mental health outcomes, their social emotional uh, response to what's going on. Do they have the language to even speak about it? So these things, particularly particularly for those who may be in spaces where uh, the disparity is there, they this can be a vicious cycle, right? But the question of like, have we ever had uh, the, um, the the hu human human values kind of built into our healthcare system, you know, I would say to the people who are are working with folks on a regular basis, uh, many of you who who have stepped to go beyond yourself to be able to help be intentional and bring a level of randomness to somebody's life, I'll ask in this room, raise your hand if you got to this seat or whatever seat that you may exist in if you did it all by yourself. No, nothing, no help, no nothing. You did it all by yourself. There's not a hand raised in this room. You can't see it, but I can see there's not a ra hand raised in this room. And that's important to note because there was a bit of randomness in each and every one of our lives that helped us get a different situated choice to, to disrupt the cycle that we may have been in, right? And it doesn't matter if you come from a level of influence or if you come from a level of disadvantage. That that import, that randomness becomes very important. It's random to us because we may not have seen it coming. And I'm sure that everyone has a story of what that randomness could look like. But that intentionality that that person or that institution or that thing had in your life gave you the choices to be able to do something different. But I will also note, going a little further, when you start to talk about the intergenerational disadvantage of folks who are in that space, you know, the declining opportunities for education uh, also have everything to do with the declining opportunities for uh, for uh, attainment from an economic standpoint, which continues the the disadvantage generationally, right? And when you start to think about the systems that exist in our communities, places like Inglewood and Compton and Detroit and Baltimore, I, I can go on and on. There's a set of systems that exist in every single one of those cities that maintain that intergenerational disadvantage, right? So I would I would venture to say that yes, there are people who see the human value of the folks that they're working with in the in the healthcare system, but the system itself and and the way that it's structured continues this cycle of people not having access, the cycle of people not ha having the opportunities to live that whole, free, thriving, healthy life that they have a proportional, I'm sorry, they have a natural law right toward, right? So there is work that we need to do in order to, to dismantle that. And, you know, I guess we can get into like what that, what the, what that nature of that work can be, but, but I just want to underscore like people's lives are really built, um, by by their uh, their experience in their environment, right? So we got to change environments. We have to change systems. We have to do work together to be able to make sure that people have that ability to a healthy, whole free life that we are talking about. Absolutely. So really, and I appreciate you bringing that out because Derek, this is sort of your very impressive model of opportunity influencers. And what influences all of our personal and community opportunities. And that's very important because we are, it's none of this, as you said, like this wasn't just something that occurred 
that was just random, that, that some people were born to certain families and this community and this community has these certain, this access or these other opportunities. There are other intentional forces at play and that have been existing, whether it's known or unknown. And we have to start to visualize them in order to drive the change that we need to see. Yeah. So thank you for bringing up that model of opportunity influencers. And so Cynthia, do we have humanity in healthcare or have we ever had it? And if we don't have it, what happened? Why did we lose it? Um, in essence, healthcare is humanity centered. I'd like to assume that. I'd like to be optimistic about that. Where do we lose it? Is, is, is that challenge? And I think that's what you're getting at in terms of the systems that were created. Um, humanity by essence is a virtue that is um, centered around love and compassion. Where did we lose the love? Where did we lose compassion in service and improving health and well-being for other beings, other human beings? Um, and I think it's 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 when sort of the ways a system functions and our own understandings of the world and decision making and creating the systems that have created the loss in that love and compassion. Um, I can't sit here and say everyone, you know go into the movement and be a leader and change the world because not many of us have that capacity or ability or we get really discouraged by a system. I will tell you the last week in my life has been a sense of it, the, the issues are so large and so heavy. Like where, where can I make that change or where can I create that influence? Um, and it's that particular question. Uh, where did we lose it and how can we get it back? Something as simple as your encounter with a patient could make vast differences as what you were talking about, that sort of point and moment in time that can change a human being's life. Drawing, like turning the mirror around and reflecting of our own being, our biases, the way they operate and the ways we engage in the world is the toughest job an individual can do. Because it's easier to be like, look at me, I'm serving everyone and I'm doing everything great and I'm just great, right? And intent and impact are two different things. You can have the best intentions and yet your impact looks vastly different. And so, you know, doing neighborhood infrastructure improvements in Watts is beautiful intent, but we had really serious conversations about the potential for displacement. And our, our, our partners were like, no, Cynthia, like we're not gonna displace folks. Like we're bringing in parks and we're, you know, improving homes and we're giving jobs. And it's like, mm. but the system has led to a private market that will increase housing that, you know, most of our residents rent. You have to think about how your projects are gonna impact displacement. So in healthcare, you know, I, I'm a storyteller by nature. So I will share so many stories with you all because these are my lessons. But, you know, I have had um, the privilege to work with a lot of um, health providers. Um, and a mentor of mine once shared how when he was practicing medicine in South LA, he had a patient that, that was overweight, that was hypertensive and met sort of the stigmas of what a South LA resident with, with those conditions looked like. As a provider, he's like, I could have just assumed who he was, given him his prescription, told him to go and assumed that he wouldn't adhere to what I told him. And so he actually had a conversation with him and said, hey, like, um, I need you to put you, I need to put you on this medication. What do you think? And he's like, uh, uh like I, I want to do some lifestyle changes. Okay. What does that mean? I need you to lose he, the, the doctor told him, I need you to lose like 50 pounds. And he's like, uh, I can't do that, but let's try it. And so they were just having this conversation. They agreed he'd lose 50 pounds for the next visit. Right. He came back and he didn't, he lost, he lost a couple, but not everything. He, he looked a lot slimmer and Instead of him, the doctor making assumptions about this non-adherent patient, he actually asked him, why didn't you lose the weight that I asked you to lose? And he said, because I ain't going to look like no chump in the streets. That's exactly what he told him. And he said, wait, what? And he's like, yeah, I could get like jumped or beaten if I, if I look like a certain way. He's like, oh, so you either die from a heart attack or you die from being out in the streets. And that just raised awareness to the physician to say, okay, then let's work together on what works for you and what doesn't work. And so they came together with the plan. That is something so simple, right? That can happen at 
the service level. You don't have to be up in arms about shifting a system. If you are in that up in arms space, start asking what the status quo looks like and if it's serving folks in a humanely way. If it's centered around love and compassion and maybe not greed and profit, right? And so I think it's it's that we, in essence, healthcare is that I don't think folks came usually to the table to serve others without that love and compassion. You all have that in you. It's just systems that have shifted the ways in which you serve and asking questions, whether at the service level or at the larger structural level, what changes need to happen if you feel they need to happen should happen and what am I possible in doing? Not everyone's a dismantler, not everyone's a disruptor, but I think we are servants of our communities and the people. Um, and these small changes that we're talking about can propel someone's life in a direction they never imagined, in a positive direction. And, and I already know that Derek wants to comment on that. Um, um, but um, Cynthia, that was that was absolutely just beautiful because you know, I can tell you as an emergency physician and also for all that are in this room, which are all healers um, in one way or the other, we went into this space to help others, to show love, to show compassion, to be of service. And I think it's oftentimes, sometimes we can become distracted and we, we actually start stepping away from being very, you know, I won't even call it patient-centered, but more human-centered and more family-centered and more community-centered and distracted by all these other entities. And when that occurs and we don't show up and we don't practice that cultural humility that you just really highlighted so beautifully of saying, tell me a little bit more about what's going on with you. What can we do together to partner on this? When we don't do that, we literally start to cause even more of a divide. Um, just, and whether we know it or not, although it may not be our intent, it is definitely the impact. So I think that story and then your message of, yes, inherently, we're all trying to be here of service in healthcare, but we have to be thoughtful about what's pushing and what's driving us and really show that love and those acts of kindness for the person in front of us. And each and every single one of us can do that, literally. Each and every single one of us can do that in this space. So um, really appreciate that in every single way you sharing that piece. So I know that we are, I mean, we could be up here for about two plus hours, but I know that people also have other things to do. So I'm going to, I'm looking at all of our amazing questions and you all have, there's one special question I'm going to ask at the very end. Um, and because we need your expertise, but I feel that some here in the room or maybe on Zoom may have some questions for you all. So I'm going to ask the team from the Office of Health Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion, if you do have a question here in the room for either Cynthia or Derek, please raise your hand. We are also monitoring all of you amazing people on Zoom. So if you do have a question on Zoom, we also have our team members that will be able to, to ask your question for you. So any questions here in the room? Okay, I see one hand that's right on over here and see a couple back, but but I do see you. your hand went up first and yes, I saw you first. So they're coming very quickly to bring you a mic. Come on down. Yeah, Becky, come on down. Come on down. No, come, come on down. Okay. Well, we'll start there and then we'll come back to you. We have we have one more over here too. We can get set up. Okay. Yes. Uh, so what's your hi? And please hi. let us know your name and then um, your question as well. That's okay. <laughs> Hi, okay, thank you. Um, my name is Nala from uh, Performance Excellence and it was lovely listening to all of the discussion. I love the question about, you know, going back to the roots of humanity. And I think going into healthcare, everyone has that compassion and empathy and wants to do, you know, all the healing work. Uh, my question is, what are your, what is your advice or your thoughts on, you know, advocating for humanity when at times it seems that um, there's selective humanity among certain groups of people. And then, you know, that kind of instills fear in people speaking out, um, you know, to advocate for humanity. So I guess, what are your advice or thoughts on that going up against, you know, people that may punish you or whatnot? 
Wow. So I I will I will I will start by saying that you know as a continuance of, of what was shared, you you may not be a person who is ready to disrupt the system, right? Maybe you have it in your heart, but when you think about what's going on in the world around you, it's like, man, I still gotta get paid, man. I don't know how like, you know, so so there's that aspect of it, but you and how you interact one on one with your peers and also with your your patients, if, if if that is the realm that you're in, being able to validate their experiences, right? Being able to start where they are and helping them build a life that's that you know at, at least in the decisions that they're making for their life to take it to the next level, and also trusting them to also be the agent of change that they need for themselves as well. Like you being able to be very intentional in that way can unlock the pieces in that person and you don't know where that's going to go, right? And and the consistency of being able to do that over and over and over again, right? If you just did one person a day, that, you know, that's 365 people a year times two times three times four. And so you've created this avenue and this space for these people who now have the capacity to also utilize the things that you Embark you imparted on them when you were actually with them, right? It's, it's that it's the power of one mentality, right? Like that one, the one person you make impact on, they will go back and impact on like two, you know, their families, which can be four, and then those four people also make the impact on their friends and their family at school or wherever at. So that becomes forty or or more, you know. So like, and it just has the cascading effect. But if we're all, if we all have that mentality of being very intentional about the randomness that we're placing in people's lives and doing it with the mentality of actually uh, invoking uh, a significant change for the better. Like we're, we're making the society better in, in that way. So, yeah, I mean, it, it sometimes does not feel like the, the, um, the market change that you want to see and that you want to have, but it's not even just the patients. That's why I said your peers too. Because when they see you doing it and they start to and, and you start to share what your practice is with them, then then without even having to uh, use the HR mechanisms or use the, uh, the, the 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 system change pieces, you've done cultural change in the environment that you're in. Now, people have these practices that they share on a regular basis. And it started with you having the intention of being the first one to actually knock the dominoes down. Your question is so real, so, so real. Um, uh, systems didn't happen organically, right? And folks are going to protect the status quo. Uh, privilege is something we don't see, and we all have it in one way or another, right? We don't see it until we make decisions without understanding that, that binary of, uh, you know, privilege versus oppression. Um, I, I don't like oppression Olympics or anything like that, but really thinking about, like, how do we reflect on that? Um, I think within that situation and that positionality, the individual needs to think about, okay, I'm not here to change anyone's mind, right? The work that I'm doing will speak for itself. Um, the commitments, the ethics, the core values I have will speak for themselves. Now, I think in the realist of ways, you're talking about job security, a supervisor who doesn't have the same values as you and whatnot. <clears throat> think about what the position you have in that moment how that may impact the ways in which it aligns with your principles. When it doesn't align with your principles, that's a question that you have to raise about whether or not you want to be in that space. And if you have the opportunity to shift that, you're not there to change your supervisor's perspective. Um, you're there to do the work that matters within the context that is safe for you. Um, and I don't think you have to negotiate your values, your principles within that context. Mm -hmm. And so it, it becomes really difficult, right? That's a lot more stark now, right? We, we see it um, sort of in the national arena right now. Um, and so, again, what are those points and moments in time that you can impact, right? It might not be large scale because there's something in the way, but it might be in that moment in time that you're actually doing effective change in ways that bring you joy. Um, and over time, that'll shift. I will say for many years, I don't know how many multi-million dollar grants we applied to for a while, and we were always left out. Like folks are just tired and they're like, really not another application. Like we never get it. Um, and when we did Watts Rising, that was the first conversation. Like 
folks don't really care about us. Like, and when I, I can't explain the feeling when we got it of like, we, we took a bus to uh, Sacramento to make the case to the strategic growth council to vote for Watts. And a lot of the residents were there. My parents were there and they cried. They're like, opportunities are coming, right? Um, and so there's always hope in that. Um, but again, you're not there to change anyone's mind. The work will speak for itself. And, and justice is not an arrival. Justice is a constant sort of commitment. And so being honest about that and being honest about your own livelihood, um, sort of social change, social movements, um, back when now a lot of the, the organizers have shared like self-care is essential. Your well-being is essential. Take care of yourself before you take care of others. That airplane rule, right? Um, and being honest about, about that with yourself and ensuring that that allows you to sleep at night is okay. But know that you're not here to change anyone's mind. I'll end by saying leadership is a decision, not a position. You know what I'm saying? So like if again. you if you are feeling like there's again. something, uh, leadership is a decision, not a position. So if someone has a position, it doesn't make them the leader of, of a movement that can be created. You have to decide. And once you decide, it be on purpose, right? And when I say on, do things purposefully, but also be on your purpose as well of what you're trying to achieve. And so as we're going to the next um, person that had a question, I believe she was right here. And I just want to, again, in the rainbow, in the rainbow in the middle, that question was really important, especially in this day and time in which there are so many attacks of thinking about supporting equity and inclusivity and justice within our academic settings, within our workplaces. And so Derek, what you mentioned about staying rooted in your core values and what you know is right, that is key. And then also what Cynthia, what you said about, this isn't just like a one day and that's it. This is about a commitment and this commitment to achieve justice is going to have to occur over generations and generations. And we were talking about that earlier. And so when you're faced with opposition, and I can say this from my roles that I've been in, when you're faced with opposition, when you're faced with barriers, it's about staying loyal to the mission and you take care of yourself and those that are around you, but it's about staying focused and intentional and purposeful and loyal to the mission. But sometimes you also have to learn how to be very strategic and agile and if something's not working to drive out cultural transformation, there's always at least 20 other ways of doing it. But they, you have to have patience. And sometimes you have to push things through. And then other times you take a step back, but you stay loyal to the mission. All right, so let's go on to the next question. Hi, everyone. Hi, my name is Narki. Hi, Dr. G. Um, I'm a public health professional. And my question is, how do you see community engagement in like programming um, advancing the healthcare system and or health justice from a community member perspective and from a public health professional perspective? Thank you. Hi, Narki, how are you? Uh, former public health student of mine at Drew. Um, an honor to see you. Uh, uh, I will. Oof. So there are many ways. Um, uh, I've I've been honored to work with the Clinical Translational Science Institute at UCLA that partners with a series of organizations um, across LA County. Charles Drew being one of them. Um, they have a community engagement research program and. It is centered around how to integrate community perspective into our academic work. How do we do applied work that, you know, knowing sort of the different evidence-based models or understanding what improves health, how does it get to the people that we're trying to actually impact? And so programs essentially in public health, right, the core values of public health are that to design these interventions that make those changes. But without that collaboration, without that understanding of people's lived experience, we're making decisions top down. And they may not translate. Another story. Um, one of my professors talked about doing some work in India. They were at a village and they had some sort of public health folks coming in, right? And folks lived in these little huts that um, they had like a, a, like a natural stove or whatnot. 
and they were um, they were getting sick from the smoke. Uh, and so what did they do? They said, hey, let's bring them some stoves. Let's change sort of the household space without asking. So they removed the stoves that they had. They added the electric stoves and critters started going in and biting them and people were getting sick. And so then they decided to ask the residents, like, what, what happened? They're like, well, the smoke would keep them out. But you took the smoke from us. So now we have this problem. And so essentially it's coming together so that we can actually make the effective changes. And we won't know what, what holds our iceberg if we don't see under it. And community engagement is that. It's bringing multiple sectors, multiple perspectives, lived experiences, challenging our power dynamics, like an alphabet soup after your name doesn't entitle you to make decisions for folks who are experiencing issues. Again, I gotta tell you, say that one more time. I, I can't, because it was a really long sentence. <laughs> Hey, alphabet suit alphabet. Your name. Not Derek and I will say it. Just because you have degrees behind your name, do not think that you're an expert on community. I think right. Kanye said it best. You ain't got to answer this way. And then and then lastly, on the like one of the things I struggle with is this cultural competency space where like a certificate tells you that you can work with certain populations. Um more more stories to that um, in terms of the ways some clinicians have actually hurt communities by making those assumptions. Moving towards a cultural humility space is understanding that that encounter is bi-directional and that that encounter is about learning from each other and building that team. And so really understanding that we challenge the competency space, yes, we've built the skills, we've built the knowledge, but that humanity component is about the humility. Last story. Yeah, well, I, I know we, we do have to wrap up because we have time. See? I know. See, as I said, we could be on this stage for hours with each other. We've been talking for a while. So. I, we're going to wrap up. and so sorry. We cannot take any more questions in one sentence. You all one sentence. What can everyone in this space and what can everyone in our virtual space do today to improve the health of communities in one sentence? Derek. I'm going to put you on the spot. Understand your starting place, comma. I'm <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry. Understand your starting place, center yourself and equity and what that really means right and and that that means that it's not you at the center you know what I'm saying? so so understand your starting place center yourself in equity and listen before you talk right yeah thank you derek cynthia one sentence I, what can everyone do today to start improving health of communities like I mentioned, practicing the hard work, turning the mirror around, practicing cultural humility, your own positionality, understanding why you do the things you do to understand how you focus. And then asking if you see something that makes you uncomfortable, how is, ask questions, be inquisitive. How, how is this operating? Is this status quo? And am I fine with it? And if the, the answers are no, continue to ask questions and find avenues to address it. Um, but really the work starts internally so that we can become better, better servants. So, so before, before we wrap up, I do want to pay respect to the online viewers for one question that oh, I'm yeah. going to combine into three uh, or combine in, uh, three questions into one. Love it. Uh, and so the question that was voted up the most was, uh, as an institution with global reach, does UCLA have a responsibility to respond to international needs? The short answer to that is yes. However, uh, Additional questions are uh, what and how can we advocate for communities mm -hmm. uh, in actual, like in action? And how can we take that advocacy, develop personal relationships with patients, with community, and then expand that uh, from there? I, I, the, the latter two pieces. I think all of it is centered in community community engagement, but also um, 
uh, uh, you know, the importance of civic engagement itself, right? Like we all have a responsibility to the communities that we're a part of, right? You, you really start to think about like the circles that you are all in and what that means and what influence you actually have. And, you know, from the macro picture of the things that we're concerned about, you know, there's only but so much we can influence on that. But when we think about our sphere of influence, going back to, you know, Stephen Covey, really, really, really good book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, you know, how can you pour all the way in into the spheres of influence that you have in a positive way, right? So going back to the sentence of understanding where your starting place is, sending yourself in equity, and then listening first, and then speaking from what you've learned, if we're all doing that, the community that we built would also have a very, very strong foundation, and we can move from there. We can have the the, the cultural differences um, uh, kind of removed out the way so that we can actually move and build together. I mean, and that, and that can look as simple as something that you and your family are doing on a regular basis to create change um, generationally for what's going on just in your family. That's one community. Um, yes, there's organizations like the Social Justice Learning Institute that are always thinking about how we can make macro shifts uh, towards, towards the betterment of society. Uh, and, and you just contributing your time on a Friday to come help out with the food distribution is a contribution to that community building that's actually happening with that with, with an organization like ours. There are so many different aspects that you can do as a singular person. But when we also come together as an entity and we're thinking like-minded to create shifts of change generationally, man, I, I, the history has already shown how that can be transformative. We're just a part of that continuum. We have an opportunity to be able to uh, make our mark in a continuum that has already embarked on on shifting change and uh, chore and and lending bending that needle towards justice. To you know, quote my man, I'm okay. You know, so uh, you know, all of this is centered in his in, in what the values that he actually brings. And I find myself in space to be able to continue on what my brother has actually brought brought forward and work that he did. Wonderful. Thank you. That collective power in every way. Cynthia, last words. Again, realism too. We can't solve all of the problems of the world um, as one human being. Partnerships, collaborations, story. And I want to thank y'all for just staying over. Um, we've been talking and it's just been a beautiful space to be with as we prepare for you all. Um, right now we're getting ready to open up a Kaiser a Medical Building in Watts. Um, and we're super excited. It'll happen next month. Um, 10 years ago, uh, I led an assessment of uh, for Kaiser where they asked, like, we're interested in building a medical office somewhere in South LA, Compton, Watts. Um, could you ask residents and folks, like, what do they think? And everyone was really excited. Everyone was all about Kaiser. Bring them to Compton, bring them to South LA, South LA bring them to Watts. One of the cool things that Kaiser had was that in Watts, they already had a mental health center. And so what did we do with the team? We offered data. I couldn't make the change. I couldn't do advocacy as an objective human being facilitating research. I had to really collect the data and offer recommendations on what folks said. That another entity took it and took action and made the decision to build this medical building. And so through partnerships, is the way in which action happens. In a global arena, it's the same way, right? What is my role? What can I contribute? And who are the folks that I need to partner with to ensure that it, it moves to action? That it's not simply knowledge production at an ivory tower, but it really gets to a space where someone, something, an entity can move it towards action. Maybe that's not your role, but maybe it is. And that's really being intentional about that. And then how to work across sectors to do that. Not even like-minded folks, right? We don't have to be like-minded to have a common vision, right? And so really essentially thinking about, about that. We can't solve the whole problems of the world and centering what our focus is, is essential through partnerships. Excellent. Those are wonderful and excellent parting words. And the two of you all know that even UCLA Health is embarking on some new endeavors um, very, very close to home. And you all will definitely be involved in those new endeavors as well. I just want to sincerely thank the two of you for your expertise and everyone. Round of applause for Dr. Cynthia Gonzalez, Derek Steele, 
we could not have had this amazing symposium without the two of you. Um, we are incredibly, incredibly grateful. And again, I want to thank all of you all that have spent the past hour and a little more with us here physically sharing space with us and also everyone on Zoom. We so appreciate you all. We, we hope the conversation today inspires you, drives a spark in you for what each one of us can do as individuals to really advance health justice in our communities, but also the importance of partnerships of in order to truly get to the goals that we all know we need to get to. So thank you all so much for attending today. And I'm gonna turn it on over to Dr. Michael Whittier to close us on out. Uh, that was just fantastic. So I'm gonna encourage everyone to go back. This will be recorded. It will exist on our UCLA Health YouTube. And so I can't recap all of the gems that were shared, uh, but we hope that you can join us for light refreshments immediately after here on B Level. Uh, and so we welcome you to have conversation with us. Uh, but as we part, uh, in 1965, uh, Dr. King said something right here on UCLA's campus. A fact is merely the absence of contradiction, but truth is the presence of coherence. Truth is relatedness of facts. And it is a fact that we've come a long, long way, but it isn't the whole truth. The truth is we have a long way to go. And so as we part, I wanna leave you with those words and say just thank you for coming out to our Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Fourth Annual Health Justice Symposium. Thanks.